to welcome uh, Bega, uh, Zanikodi, and Anita. Thank you for joining class. And also welcome uh, online students, our e-learning students who will listen to these lectures later on. Uh, hope you all of you are enjoying your uh, learning on the book of Romans. Just such a powerful, so many truths that uh, we've already discovered, we've already learned, and um, hope that even as we journey on in this um, learning, this book, you know that God would reveal deeper truths, His mysteries, His word, His kingdom in our lives, and this truth will of us and you know bear fruit in our lives, in our ministry. And uh, you know, even as so we engage with fact them as well, we are learning. We found it, you know, who we are and what we are teaching and how we relate uh, with people. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Um, sorry, I just lost my network connection. Okay, we'll begin with a word of prayer, and uh, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Lead us in prayer. Today is uh, Jeffina's birthday, so uh, wishing her a very blessed, God bless you, Jeffina. She's looking really beautiful, dressed up. <laughs> uh, I, like the, I like the enthusiasm, her enthusiasm to celebrate her special day, and you know, just... Uh, Blessings to Jeffina, even as she said it. Can uh, any one of you lead us in prayer and uh, can pray for Jeffina? Anyone? Celebrating a birthday today, so can pray for Jeffina and for us. Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, as we begin our third session, we thank you for Pastor Selena. As she's going to teach from your word, I pray that you have empowered her so that she can teach us according to your will. I pray for more of your muse, uh, wisdom and more of your grace over her life to teach the truth to us and prepare each one of our hearts so that our hearts are ready to receive what you have in store for us. This, our session, Lord. Our hearts are ready, our hearts are receptive, Lord Father God. Bless each one of us, Lord, and especially, Lord, I uh, want to lift up um, our classmate, our sister, Jeffrey, and to return to Lordship. I thank you for her life, Lord. I thank you for she's a woman of destiny, and I pray that as she celebrates her birthday, continue to bless her with good health, with your wisdom, with your grace, that she will grow uh, rooted and grounded in you that and she will continue to be a channel of blessings, Lord, wherever she goes, Lord. Bless her abundantly, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Zalito. We appreciate that. So last week, uh, sorry, on Monday, we looked at uh, chapter four and we read through chapter five and uh, we all shared, you know, um, um, what we received from chapter five the Holy Spirit is speaking to us or something that really imparted into our spirit man, that was imparted to our spirit man, something that really encouraged us. So some of you shared. And uh, this morning, we look at uh, studying chapter 5 in detail. So uh, chapter 5 is talking about grace and righteousness. So Paul has already, you know, written or has communicated to the church that we receive righteousness by faith, um, you know, because Jesus was delivered up for our offenses and he was raised for our justification. And so then he talks about uh, how, you know, we have been justified, having been justified, what do we have? Okay. So in verses 1 to verse 4, he's basically talking about, you know, now that we have been justified, that we have been made righteous, by faith and not keeping the law and the sign of God's of the covenant of circumcision, but we have been justified by faith freely, uh, which is a, uh, which is by the grace of God. So, having been justified, what do we have? 
Okay, so that is what he's trying to uh, talk about or uh, write or say in verses one to five. So, can one of you please read verses one to five, please? Romans chapter five, verses one to five. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all we have access by, by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, Tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen. Thank you, uh, Lubega. So here, you know, the words justify, justification, righteous, uh, righteousness means the same thing because they have the same root word. It means that we have been made faultless or blameless. You know, we have been made just or right uh, before God. We have been made right in God's sight and right standing with God. And we have made, uh, we have been made just as if we have never sinned. So what does it mean to be justified by faith? Or what are the outcomes of being justified by faith? Paul says, you know, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which means we are one with God. Uh, we are not in a fighting mode, so to say, with God. You know, we are friends with God. We have a good relationship with God because we are justified with God. So we should never think that God is angry with us or God is upset with us because it says that God has peace with us. Why, don't, why, can't, why can't we think that you know, God is angry with us or he's upset with us um, uh, because you know, God has peace with us, which means that we are no longer, we are being justified. Uh, with God, we are made righteous with God, and that means that you know God has peace with us. We are no longer, you know, uh, uh, enemies of God. We are no longer in a fighting war with God, but we are friends with God. We are His children. So, in um, you know, uh, verse two, He's you know He says, to whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of uh, God. Okay, So there, uh, he goes on to talk about four outcomes of being justified uh, uh, here in this passage. There are four outcomes of being justified that he mentions here. The first thing is he says we have, you know, the we have peace with God. And then second thing he says that we have access by faith into a standing in grace. And the third thing he says, you know, uh, uh, what is the standing of grace mean to us? Okay. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, um, that, you know, we have, uh, uh, the third thing he says that we are in a place of rejoicing. And the fourth thing he says, we rejoice in tribulation. So four things. The first thing, peace with God. Second thing is access by faith into a standing in grace. The third thing is that we are in a place of rejoicing. And the fourth thing is that we rejoice in tribulation. Okay, so we'll just look at the four outcomes of what it means to be justified by faith. The first thing we said is peace with God which means we are, we are one with God. Uh, we are basically reconciled with God, uh, which means God is not our enemy. Uh, we are not in a fighting mode with God. That's the first thing what we mean when we say we are peace with God. And the second thing is only when we have peace with God, you know, we can have the peace of God. Okay? 
only when we have we are in a peaceful relationship with God, when we are friends with God, when we have peace with God, can we have the peace of God. So sometimes, you know, when we think, hey, there is that peace that is missing uh, in my life, you know, when the Bible says that even though we go through this disappointments, tribulations, brokenness, pain, we experience the peace of God, but I'm not experiencing this peace, maybe it's because you know, somewhere that you are not in that area of your life in peace with God. Because when you're in peace with God, you will experience the peace of God. Okay? The second outcome of being justified is we have access by faith into a standing of grace, which means we are in a position where we are highly favored by God. Isn't that wonderful? That when we are made righteous, when we are justified, you know, not only do we have peace with God, we are also in a place where we are highly favored by God. You know, we, we um, enter into the standing in grace simply by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Okay. So this access of faith into a standing in grace, this, this faith that we have is we have entered into it because we're standing in grace simply by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. So what, it, what does it mean to be standing in grace? Okay. To be standing in grace means to God we are loved as Christ has loved us. Okay, so we're just looking basically at point two. We're looking at what it means to be standing in grace. When you're standing in grace, it means to God we are loved as Christ is loved. Okay, John chapter 17, verse 23 says, The world may know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me. That is what it means to be standing in grace. That means, you know, we are loved as Christ is loved. That means God loves us just as he loves jesus christ the second meaning of standing in grace means to god we are well pleasing okay matthew chapter 3 verse 17 says it is like the father speaking over us that he spoke over jesus this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased so you know the father spoke about the son saying that he is well pleasing to him so in the same way you know well pleasing means it's the same way the father is speaking over us just like he spoke over jesus that this is my beloved son or this is my beloved daughter you know whom i am well pleased in and the third meaning we can say about standing in grace means to god we are fully accepted ephesians chapter 1 Verse 6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in his beloved. That means to God we are fully accepted. And the next one to be standing in grace means to God we are blessed beyond measure. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he has blessed us with everything, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And also to God, we are holy and without blame. So when we say we are standing in grace, it means that to God that we are in a place where we are holy and blameless, faultless. Uh, we read this in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in okay. And to be standing in grace also means that before God, we are faultless, unaccused, and there is no condemnation. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says, and you, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and before reproach in his sight. Okay? So isn't that wonderful that when we are reconciled to God, you know, uh, through the death of Jesus Christ, we are presented as holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And the last thing what we mean when we say that we are standing in grace to God, we are qualified. Okay, 
uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, saying, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Okay? So <clears throat> there is nothing more that we can add to this in our own efforts except embrace all of this that we receive uh, by grace through faith and we just work worthy of this. So, and so he says, therefore, all we do. So, you know, he says, how do we relate to God? You know, how we face the devil and all we do in the Christian ministry, it's basically, you know, it flows out of our standing in grace. We stand in a place without sin, without a sense of guilt, without a sense of shame and condemnation. So in all we do, you know, how do we relate to God? How do we face the devil? How do we, you know, face the challenges that we face in life? How do we approach Christian ministry? Uh, you know, we do it all out of flowing, out of, the, of, our, out of our standing in the grace that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, okay? So the reason we live uh, holy, you know, lives, the reason why we renounce sin and ungodliness, the reason why we work hard, pursue excellence, make sacrifices, take risks, uh, is not to earn anything from God, uh, but because we desire to honor him, to give him the best that we can, you know, out of all the love that we have for him, and knowing that we're already standing in this place of grace, okay? Uh, and knowing that whatever we do is not going to, you know, earn us grace, but knowing that he has already actually empowered us by his grace, you know, and, um, you know, and, and he has intended us to come to this place where we give him all the glory and the honor and the love and manifest his glory uh, for where he has positioned us that we have already been positioned or we have already have a standing in grace. Okay. So that is why we need to, uh, you know, desire to live a holy life, give up sin, you know, uh, live in a, a, a godly life, give up ungodliness, work hard, you know, pursue excellence for the kingdom of God, make sacrifices, you know, take those risks that God wants us to take, uh, you know, not uh, to earn anything from God because we've already received, you know, everything that God has given to us, uh, we have already received, but uh, we do it because we desire to honor him. And we do it because we want to give him our best because of what he's already given us. He's already given us a standing in grace. Imagine standing in grace, you know, uh, causes us to be loved just as God loves Jesus, causes us to be well-pleasing before him. Who are we to be well-pleasing before him? Causes us to be fully accepted, to be blessed beyond measure, to be holy and without blame to be faultless, unaccused, and no condemnation, and to be uh, qualified. So, you know, just look at the immense um, blessing that we have received because of our standing in grace. So what should be our response is, you know, all that we do, should be we should do it out of our love and on honor the one who has given us a right standing in grace, okay? Um, because he's already actually empowered us in his grace and we are here to express our honor and love to him for all that he has done uh, for us and what he has given us the third thing uh, the third outcome of us being justified you know is um uh, is to be in a place of rejoicing okay we are rejoicing for the good things that God has planned for us. Uh, uh, he's going to release his uh, glory upon us that he has kept for us. That's why he says the hope of the glory of God. Okay, So we, we have this hope that we will share in God's glory. Imagine who are we to share in the glory of uh, God. You know, but we have this hope that we are going to share in the glow in God's glory. Part of this includes uh, being in His presence in um, heaven, uh, and there is all the things that we enjoy, uh, which is part of this glory. 
a God that we are enjoying. We enjoy the peace with God. We have the grace of God. Uh, but there is more that God has kept for us. So we are rejoicing in that hope as well, that one day, you know, we will all be people who will you know, share in God's glory, even as we are already experiencing it now, uh, uh, through the peace that we have with God and the grace of God, the right standing uh, um, in the grace that God has uh, given us. Okay? And we're also rejoicing in the hope that will, we will receive as well, that we would, you know, share in God's glory. The fourth outcome of us being justified is to rejoice in tribulation. So why do we rejoice in tribulation? Why should we rejoice in tribulation? Why should we rejoice when we go through trials and difficulties? What does the verse say? Verse 3. Because what is the result of tribulation? What is it going to produce in us? It's going to develop perseverance, endurance, character, and hope in us. Okay? So next time, you know, any of us go through tribulations or you're going through tribulations and difficulties and hardships, you know, uh, glory in that, worship God, just rejoice, praise Him. You know, why? Because uh, the, what is, look at what the results are going to be. It's going to give you, make you persevere, give you more endurance, character and hope in us. Okay. So that is what he says in uh, in verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. So when we go through hard times, we can still be happy. When things are difficult and hard, we are not, you know, we shouldn't be down, dejected or depressed, but we glory in tribulations. He says knowing. What do we know? We know that tribulations develops endurance endurance means what our ability to stay on the course the ability to run, continue to run our race and um, verse 4 says it produces character and character increases hope okay so when we go through tribulation it develops endurance it's our ability to stay on the course and when we stay on our course our character is developed uh, who we are as people is being developed, okay? When our character is developed, we become people of hope, which means we can look at things, the positive side, even though we are going through tribulations, okay? So we can look at things hopefully that, hey, there's something good that is going to come out. You know, God can, uh, you know, uh, bring things that are not as though they're though they are things that does, does not exist you can bring those things out just like we looked at in chapter uh, four so we have the hope and that is what we say abraham had that hope that even though things were good as dead against all hope he believed and it was credited to him as uh, righteousness okay so uh hope is the expression of us being a strong character that means we are people who um, have been tried, you know, uh, tested, and we have been proved. Even in difficult situations, we can still have hope, and hope is not going to disappoint us. Amen. Uh, we will not be disappointed. The hope will become a reality. Going back to chapter four, you know, against all hope, Abraham believed. You know, even though his body was good as dead, Sarah's body was good as dead, but believed God who can call things that are not as though they are. And so God can give life to things that are dead. He can call those, those things and can give life. And against all hope, Abraham believed, even though he could not see. Okay. Um, and that hope did not disappoint Abraham. He had the son of promise with his wife Sarah and we know that you know hope will not disappoint us and that hope will become a reality even as we spoke about 
the, uh, the class on Monday, we spoke about the difference between hope and faith. Okay? Faith is actually the present reality, substance of what you know we are we are seeing, something that we experience. Hope is something you know into the future. But you know when um, when we have hope, uh, uh, or when we uh, glory in tribulation, we will have this hope, which means this hope will become a reality. It can be something that we can experience and see in the here and in the now. He says the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Okay, so right now the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. We are experiencing the love of God being poured out into our hearts. Okay, and then he talks about this in verses five to eight. The love God has for us. So can somebody please read verses five to eight, please? Or before we look at verses five to eight, anyone has any doubts, any questions, anything you'd like to share? You need any clarity? No? Okay, we'll move on to verses 5 to 8. Can somebody please read verse 5 to 8, please? Verse 5, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still par powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So in tribulation, you know, I'm a person who can... You know, uh, be filled with the hope. Why? Because God's love has been poured into my heart. The same way in tribulation, you can be a person full of hope. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into your heart, which means you can experience the love of God. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Right now, the love of God has been poured out. We're experiencing the love of God that has been poured out into our hearts here and now. And it's the Holy Spirit, you know, who enables us to personally experience the love of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to walk in the love of God, okay? And it's not just that we experience the love of God, but it's also Holy Spirit that help us, you know, helps us to be able to love others, okay? Because if God's love is poured out into our hearts, not only do you experience it in your life, you know, uh, not only that you experience the love of God in your life, but also, you know, you and I are able to turn around and say, if God has loved me, you know, I can love others as well. Okay, so to the measure that I experience the love of God is the measure I can extend the love of God to others, right? So if you're not able to love others, uh, you know, if you're not able to speak kind words to others, if you're not being gracious, you know, merciful, compassionate to others, it's basically you have not experienced the full measure of the love of God. To the extent, the measure of the love of God that you experience in your heart, you're able to extend that love of God to others, okay? If God could love us in spite of our faults, then you know I can. I need to love others in spite of their weakness, right? The same love that is poured out into our hearts, you know, which we experience personally, which makes us more than conquerors in difficult situations, which give us gives us the conviction, you know, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The same love we can extend to other people and hopefully they too will feel the same kind of love that they, they and hopefully they can also feel that they are more than conquerors in difficult situations and nothing can separate them from God's love. Okay? Verse 5, uh, he says, you know, in verse 5 he says, now hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, we can understand it both as the love of God, 
you know, that has been poured out into our hearts, creating in us uh, an experience, an intim in intimate, personal knowing of the love of God, or intimate, personal uh, understanding or knowing uh, the love that God has for us. And it could also mean that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts, giving us the capacity to love others. So two things, we're experiencing uh, the intimate, personal uh, love of God, knowing the love of God, understanding the love God has for us, and also the love of God being poured into our hearts, giving us the capacity to love others just as he loves us. And later on in chapter 8, you know, uh, Paul will describe for us how powerful this love is, uh, which God has for us. Um, first, he points to the cross as the place where God demonstrated this great love. And he says, all this is possible because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, in verses 6 to 11, uh, Paul is basically focusing on Christ's death for us. He's focusing on the cross. And in verse 6, um, you know, I like to emphasize three things. Uh, verse 6, I like to read it out for us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the and ungodly. So just like to mention or uh, emphasize three things here. The first thing is, it says, when we were without strength when we were without strength so later on in this chapter you know he will talk about how we are in a place of strength when we are reigning in life so here there's a contrast being built later on in this chapter he'll talk about you know how we are in a place of strength when we reign in life but here he's, there's a contrast being uh, being built he's saying when we are without strength so when we were without strength, uh, we were weak, we were powerless, we were in slavery to many things, and uh, this was our condition. And when we were in the stage, you know, we were without strength, okay? And the second thing I like to emphasize uh, from verse 6 is that he says, at the right time, Christ, you know, died. At the right time, um, in, or in due time, Christ died for the um, ungodly, okay? So, we see that Adam and Eve sinned 4,000 years before Christ died, okay? So, we can, we can think, why did God take so long? You know, why did he take 4,000 years uh, to die for the sins of mankind? If Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, and if God, you know, uh, had the solution or he had this plan of redemption already in his mind uh, that he's going to redeem mankind from sin, then why couldn't he have executed his plan uh, the very next day or the very next moment when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, okay? Uh, why did he wait for 4,000 years? Because Christ should have come immediately and died. There are only two people sinned only two people would have been saved would have been redeemed and the rest of mankind would be free from sin okay uh why did god take four thousand years so god waited for four thousand years and you know people suffered and faced the consequences for sin for four thousand years but scripture tells us that at the right time christ died for us okay in due time which means it's not the Kronos time, but the Kairos time, the God-appointed time, the right time, you know, when um, when Christ died for us. So 4,000 years, actually, in our mind, is such a long time, right? But for God, it's the right time. Uh, we cannot understand everything. We cannot understand God's timing, why he does what he does, when he does it. Uh, we cannot understand God's timing. Uh, we can say he revealed himself. He brought the nation of Israel into being. He gave them the laws, the covenants. Uh, no, but if you look at the main thing to happen, Christ to come and die for our sins, it took 4,000 years. And we can't understand everything about God's timing, but we trust that it is the right time God does what he has to do. Okay. So the same thing about the return of Christ. There's been 2,000 years since Christ died. 
So when is Jesus going to come? Okay. But the only thing we can say is at the right time he will come and we just rest in that. Okay. And then he says, you know, um, in verse 6, that in, in the due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay. So ungodly is people who don't deserve his grace, his mercy, and his love. And he contrasts this with what he says in verse uh, 7. He says, no one will give their life for an other good person. Very rarely will they give their life up. But he says in verse 8, this is what Christ did for us. Or this is what God did for us. Us okay, so verse 7 says, For scarcely, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would bear to die. But verse 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us, you know, his own love for us, or his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for uh, us. Okay, so um, while we were still sinners, while we were still ungodly, while we were still without strength, God demonstrated his own love towards us. And Paul is saying, this is not about us, whether we are good or blameless. It's not about us, whether we are noble or worthy. But God is saying, um, and I know, I know that you are ungodly. I know that you are without strength. I know that you are sinners. And I love you so much. And I'm going to show you that I love you. Okay. So this is the full extent of God's love. I mean, it, it, this is so amazing. This can just, you know, can just blow our minds that, you know, when we look at human love, so much based on what we do, what we give, you know, um, sometimes we can just love and love and the other person is not able to receive, not able to understand, you know, like God is saying, I know who you are. I, I know you are ungodly. I know that you are without strength. I know that you are sinners. And God is saying, I still love you so much. Isn't that so amazing? You know, and he's saying, I'm going to show you how much I love you. And that is a uh, agape love. That is the God kind of love. And that is the love that really holds us and strengthens us that, that we can really depend on and we can run with the rest of our lives. Okay. So he's saying, this is how I'm going to do it. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. So this is the love God has poured out in our lives. You know, um, back in verse 5, we know, uh, and here it's an evidence, the proof that God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we are still sinners, you know, Christ died for us. So at times, you know, we feel uh, God really does not love us. We feel that God does not, I, sometimes we feel that God does not really love me. Or we tend to determine and judge God's love for us. Um, uh, when nice things happen uh, and, you know, when wrong things happen, we think that, you know, he doesn't love us, he doesn't care for us. I think that's a wrong thing to do. Uh, what we must know and what we must do is when we feel that you know God does not love us or God is punishing us or he doesn't care for us we need to look at the cross so every time we want to know God's love for us we must look at the cross we must say you know this is how much God loved me that he gave Jesus his only son for me you know while I was ungodly while I was without strength while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And this is God's demonstration of his love for me. And I know that maybe now in the stage where I am, I'm not living a life that is right. You know, I might be without strength. I might be seen as a sinner. But, you know, God still loves me. So never doubt God's love for you. Never doubt that you are not in peace with God because he says we are already in peace with God. And never doubt God's love for you because he always loves you. Okay. So Christ died for you and me. What is the result? What is the result of Christ dying for you and me? Uh, we look at it in verses 9 to 11. Uh, we are reconciled to God. Can somebody read uh, verses 9 to 11, please? 
Uh, before that, anyone has any questions, any doubts, anything you'd like to ask on what was explained so far? Uh, I just want to ask a question from this one, two, five. Uh, we see, uh, Can you increase the volume because I'm not able to hear you? Yeah, okay. Is it fine now? Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to ask a question from years one to five, uh, where we see uh, in verse two, uh, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then in verse three, we see, we also glory in tribulations. Are these glories the same word? I mean, we are glory, glory in tribulation, and in verse two it says glory of God. So, what the word glory actually is? Okay. So, uh, this is a so, what do we mean when we say the glory of God? When we mean when we say the glory of God, we basically mean uh, who God is and what he does. It just basically uh, talks about the manifestation of the, the nature of God, his character, his attributes, okay, who he is, is revealed uh, or manifested through his works as well. So when we talk about the glory of God, it's basically talking about who God is and what he does. But when we're saying when we glory in tribulation, it means that we uh, rejoice, we we worship, we praise, uh, we give thanks in uh, tribulation. Uh, because when we do that, yes, we experience the manifest glory of God. That means we experience his nature and we also experience his work, what he does, signs, miracles and wonders. Anyone else has any questions? Any doubts, anything you want me to explain again? I hope all of you are following. Am I too fast? Okay. Last time we are with you, no problem. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, so Christ died for us. So what is the result, you know, of Christ's death? The first thing is being reconciled to God, and he talks about this in verse 5 to 11. So, can somebody please read 5 to 11, please? Verse 9 to 11. Verse 9 to 11. Yes. Much more than being unjustified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. Was Levin as well? Please? Verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now to see the atonement. Amen. Thank you, Abu Baker. So here it says, because Christ died for us, we have been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath, the judgment through him, and we are saved from eternal judgment. Okay. So in verse 10, we see for if when we were enemies, so he's, you know, looking at the past when we were ungodly, when we were without strength, when we are sinners. And now we are adding to the list that, you know, he's adding to the list that we were even enemies with God. But, you know, we have been reconciled to God because of his death. Okay. So he says that, you know, he's already said in the past we were ungodly, we were without strength, we were sinners. Now he's adding to the list of who we were before we were, you know, reconciled to God. He says now, we are also enemies with God, but now we are reconciled to God. Okay, so just imagine uh, two friends, James. We can just name them as James and John. There's no James and John in our classroom. So imagine James has borrowed huge amounts of money from John, 
And then, you know, he turns against John, bringing all kinds of false allegations against him and, sorry, and doing much damage to him. And, uh, you know, John has a choice. What is what? What are the choices that John has? He can choose to retaliate. He can choose to ignore, or he can choose to reach out to restore his relationship with James. Okay, so he's all these options. Now imagine John goes to James and forgives his debt completely. Okay, forgives all the wrong that James has done to him and only ask for friendship to be restored to him. Wouldn't that be amazing? It'd be truly amazing, right? So in a similar way, you know, or in a far greater way, we were enemies with God, okay? We are the ones who owed a great debt because of our sin. We were the ones who were hostile towards God. We were the ones who were so indifferent to God. But it was God himself who came to us, you know. It was God himself who took that initiative. It was God himself who paid our debt in full uh, by giving his son, Jesus, and God himself making a way for us so that we can become friends with him and be reconciled to him and have the peace of God and, you know, have the right standing with God. So he says, because we are reconciled, we are also being saved from eternal judgment because of what Christ has done for us. That means we have eternal life and we are saved from eternal judgment. Okay. Uh, we have this assurance that we have eternal life, that we will spend eternity uh, with God where we can experience the fullness of his glory. Okay. We'll stop there or we'll continue with verse 11 um, on Friday. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? I hope you're enjoying our study on Romans chapter 5. It's just very powerful truths. It sometimes just overwhelms me, but it's just so good, so powerful. And thank God for you know what he has um, inspired. Also, Paul to write in the opportunity that we have to help. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have uh, no questions to ask. We we'll end class now. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead. Enjoy your week. God bless you. Even as you are standing in His grace, enjoy all the benefits and the blessings of His uh, grace in a full measure. Okay, enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Pastor. We appreciate it. Thank